Hey guys, I am at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. You can see it behind me and awesome planes and stuff. And um, this is an awesome Air and Space Museum. They have some real cool Apollo stuff. So I am going to, ooh, planes overhead. This is the, uh, ah, just gonna let that go. Can you see it? No. Ooh, plane. Nailed it. Okay, so it's under a flight path, which is kind of fun for an air and space museum. Uh, also kind of annoying, but um, I'm gonna show you guys some of the super cool Apollo stuff that they have in this museum. So come with me. All right, so this is one of my all-time favorite museums, um, largely because I've always come here for really exciting events. Um, namely, this gallery is turned into like a beautiful event space for things like the Apollo 13 45th anniversary event that I went to last year. That was where I got to meet Jim Lovell and Jean Krantz and watch a harpist kind of freak out that Jean Cernan stood next to her and sort of like posed for pictures while she continued playing without missing a note. And also this amazing panel happened that's Fred Hayes and Jim Lovell and Cy Liebergott and Clint Howard who played Cy Liebergott in Apollo 13 and Walt Cunningham and Rusty Schweikert and Gene Krantz and Jerry Griffin are up there and I can't recognize anyone else in this picture off the top of my head. But aside from the amazing events I've been to at this museum, it also has an incredible collection, including the actual gumdrop, the command module from Apollo 9. Apollo 9, of course, was the first mission to do so many things. It was the first time two spacecraft, the command service module and the lunar module, were flown simultaneously but separately, albeit in Earth orbit, it didn't go to the moon. But this was the mission that all the test pilots wanted because this was the flight that really proved all the Apollo technology was up for the challenge of going to and landing on the moon. This mission flew in March of 1969 with Jim McDivitt, Rusty Schweikert, and Dave Scott on board. And had it not worked, Apollo 10 would not have been able to go to the moon and basically do the real dress rehearsal of the lunar landing, and Apollo 11 wouldn't have been able to land. So Apollo 9 is really one of those like unsung hero missions of the Apollo program. And my favorite thing about the way this is presented at this museum, it's not fully encased in plexiglass. There's just a plastic cover over the hatch which has been removed so that you can actually see inside the spacecraft and you can you're not supposed to but you know if kids touch it it won't get damaged but the rest of it is actually just open to the air that means you can actually see just how much damage was done during a re-entry you get a really great sense of just what happens to that spacecraft and it's totally totally beautiful hard to tell given the uh, reflective glass on top but guys it's so tiny I wish I could do a 360 video inside this to show you what it looks like but like it's Apollo 9 guys it's kind of awesome and you know reflection in the glass this museum also has a collection of four moon rocks which is just kind of awesome to see uh, one from Apollo 11, one from Apollo 17, one from Apollo 15, and I gotta be honest, I forget where the fourth one is from. Um, but for Moon Rocks, the one from Apollo 17, as you can see, is actually quite sizable. It is really impressive. And another reason that I really like going to this museum on a very personal note is that my dear friend, Francis French, is the education director there. Francis and I have worked on a couple of projects together. Most recently, uh, Don Isley, Apollo 7's command module pilot's autobiography. Francis edited the volume and I contributed an historical context section, just a chapter towards the end, but it was so great to work with him. He also, of course, left a blurb on the back of my book. And the benefit and one of the great things about knowing the education director at a museum is that you get the inside scoop on some of the artifacts, the stories that they don't write on those little placards, like the story of the odd suit for Bill Anders that is in this museum. The reason we have this, you know, the Smithsonian has asked for most of these back is it, so it, it was never acquired by the Smithsonian because nobody really knows why this suit exists. You know, Bill Anders flew on, on Apollo 8 and then he was back up on Apollo 11, which would have put him on what ended up becoming Apollo 13, but then he decided to transfer over to a government job. And uh, we can only guess that this spacesuit was kind of designed in case he came back or that they'd started doing it right before he announced that because it's nothing to do with Apollo 8 or 13. And the suit's he never even wore it. 
He may have won it in training, oh. um, but nobody's really sure. There's no real story behind it. Like, once, he flew, once he flew a train with, they have uh, WA Anders on, and this one just has Anders. So, oh. That guy's from DuPont come in the back. They've opened the back. They've looked at the serial numbers. They've been trying to work out what it is, but oh. we don't know. And of course, it is an air and space museum. It is not at all limited just to space flight. It's actually got way more planes than space stuff, although their space stuff is awesome. There, I couldn't even get through all of the things. It is so densely packed. It's kind of awesome. You just have to go and check it out. So once you go through the tour of history of aviation, you end up in the little space era of it. And there's a Gemini hanging from the ceiling. There's an Apollo command service module from the ceiling. There's also a, a model of Sputnik hanging so you get a sense and of Explorer 1. So you can see how big slash small some of these things are. Um, and there's some really amazing, amazing things in this gallery as well. One of my all-time favorite things that's in this museum is the X-15 canopy as well as Neil Armstrong's X-15 suit awkwardly back in the parking lot now but as you guys can see with the museum in the background there is so much awesome stuff to come see at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. If you are in the area or anywhere near the area I would highly recommend making a trip out here. Oh car that's gonna be loud. <laughs> um, I would highly highly recommend making a trip out here to see all the stuff and I didn't show you guys all the planes in there because I'm less good on my aviation but I think I hear another plane in the sky overhead. Um, there's tons of awesome stuff out here definitely worth checking out so so if you're ever in San Diego, go to the Air and Space Museum and tweet me your pictures of cool space things. And there's a plane somewhere up there um, worth checking out. All right, bye guys.